Good evening and welcome to Scotland at 7 on the 1st of March. Welcome to the programme. Joining me on the programme this evening, my special guests this evening are Roger Mullen from the SNP's National Executive Committee. Welcome to the programme, Roger. Good evening. Nice to see you. Thanks, Roger. We'll talk to you later on in the programme. And also joining us this evening, uh, Fatima Jijo as well. Hi, Fatima. How are you this evening? Oh, Joji, I beg your pardon. I've run your name down wrongly there, Fatima. Fatima <laughs> Joji. It's all right. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here as usual. OK, thank you, Fatima. So we're going to get on with the coronavirus update, first of all. As of two o'clock today, a total of 1,688,881 people in Scotland have now been tested through NHS Scotland Labs and UK government regional testing centres since the start of the pandemic. Of these, 1,486,411 were confirmed negative, 202,470 have tested positive. There are 386 new confirmed cases of COVID-19. This will, of course, be an underestimate of the number of cases. Not everyone with the virus displays the symptoms and not all those with the symptoms will be tested. There were zero new reported deaths of people who have tested positive today. The number of patients in Scotland who have died from complications caused by the coronavirus COVID-19 infection now stands at 7,131. This number only includes those who have died having received a positive test for the virus in the previous 28 days. Of the people who have tested positive, 824 were in hospital last night, 71 of whom were in intensive care. Now, as of 8am this morning, 1,611,578 people have now received their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccination, and 78,865 had received their second dose. The latest UK daily figures published today show that 122,953 patients who tested positive for COVID-19 have sadly died from their illness, an increase of 104 since yesterday. This number refers to deaths in all settings and not just to hospitals. Now to tonight's main headlines and a new variant of COVID-19 has been detected in Scotland. Three cases of a COVID-19 variant of concern, first identified in Manaus in Brazil, have been identified in Scotland. Following their return to the northeast Scotland from Brazil via Paris and London, three Scottish residents entered self-isolation and then subsequently tested positive for coronavirus COVID-19. These individuals then self-isolated for the required period of 10 days. The tests were completed early February and passed to the UK's Advanced Sequencing Capabilities Programme, which detected this new variant. Due to the potential concerns around this variant and other passengers on the flight used by the three individuals from London to Aberdeen are being contacted. These three cases are not connected to the three cases already identified in England. Health protection teams, including local clinicians, have assessed each case and their contacts and are arranging protective measures for the small number of potentially exposed individuals. To provide an extra layer of safety, teams are ensuring that people who could have been infected by these first-line contacts are also isolated and tested. This is to ensure that all possible precautions are taken as we learn more about this new particular variant. Um, Fatima, let me come to you first of all. Um, we've talked before on this programme about the differences in the attitudes to uh, coronavirus uh, restrictions, particularly between uh, the United Kingdom and Scotland with regards to people flying in from abroad. Do you think this is, a, uh, or this is highlighting uh, a weakness in the armour, if you like, a chink in the armour, uh, that we need to do something about? Um, yeah, if you're talking about um, the lack of a four nations approach, we need to recognise that we can see that the COVID um, that COVID nineteen is having a different impact across cities, countries, and regions. And at this stage, we need to be more proactive. Like I have so much praise for our first minister, who has been out in front of this every day, recognising that um, prevention is better than cure. Like I know it's hard. Um, it's having a significant impact on people across their social and economic lives, but um, we need to get ahead of this. And I'm glad to hear from what you said that we are getting ahead of this new strain. It does sound like it. Um, because um, the Scottish government modelling that published um, that was published in, on the 7th of January suggests that without swift decisive action towards um, COVID-19 and any strain, um, that we could be seeing the NHS pushed beyond its capacity within three weeks. So we need to be able to take um, 
appropriate action and be quick about it. And we can't really wait um, for for instance, the UK government to respond, who from the beginning, Boris Johnson's, Boris Johnson, for instance, his response was really slow at the beginning. Um, Nicola Sturgeon at one point was calling for a COBRA meeting um, days ahead before Boris even responded. So um, absolutely, I understand that people are concerned that we have different approaches as a nation, but we ha are recognising that the strains are having a different impact across regions, cities and countries. OK, thank you very much, Fatima. Roger, if I could come to you now, and I was talking to, to uh, Fatima there about the differences in approach. I heard uh, Jason Leach um, on the radio this afternoon talking about how the infection rates across the four nations of the UK are, are gradually um, kind of aligning to be approximately the same. Um, at the moment, I believe Scotland's uh, infection rate is slightly lower than that in England, and I think the Welsh uh, figure was also uh, a little better. Is there a particular reason? Is there something that we can put this down to? Well, it's going to be very difficult to really give a cause uh, on a day-by-day -day basis. We're going to have to wait for more thorough research once this period is all over. But I certainly think I would agree with Fatima in that the uh, actions that the Scottish government have continually taken within their limited powers uh, has been very effective looking at it in comparison with the other UK nations. Uh, a long time ago, I remember being in Broadcasting Scotland in the early days of the pandemic, saying that one of my big worries was that we didn't have control of the borders to the extent that we needed so that we couldn't take the type of action, say, in New Zealand or in Australia or in South Korea or the like we're taking. And I think what has been happening and what has been reported about the uh, strain that has come in uh, uh, a short time ago uh, reveals the problem of trying to control your borders when people are coming in from uh, different routings so yes. that although there were people from Brazil they came in as I understand it via Paris via London and it would be London up to uh, Aberdeen and the like so it, it makes it much more difficult to control I would just like to give credit however to the three people who my understanding is that they did the right thing they self-isolated all three in the Northeast we know who they are where they are, and they've been obeying the rules, and that's been enormously helpful. So I think, as well as the Scottish Government, we need to give credit to the individuals involved. Um, Roger, one of the things that people maybe don't realise is that before these individuals uh, travelled into the United Kingdom, or got on a plane in fact, um, almost all of them would have had to have had a Covid test, and I'm assuming that that was done. Um, were there other tests done at stops along the way? Because I understand they did stop in Paris and then um, probably Heathrow, certainly London, uh, before coming back to Aberdeen. I'm puzzled as to why the, the infections weren't picked up at one of these other airports. Do we know anything about that? Uh, well, uh, I certainly don't know anything about that. I, I would imagine a lot of that would depend upon what the schedule was whether they were being screened or not mm. as they were in transit. Because I would imagine that what they were is in, in transit situations in Paris. And uh, I'm not sure what the situation was uh, in London. But my understanding is that they, they were tested for coming here, that they have been complying with the rules when here, self-isolating and testing. So from that point of view, I think if we look at it in terms of have the Scottish government been ensuring that there have been appropriate measures in place, I think we can confidently say yes to that. What the situation was in the likes of Paris, uh, I'm not too sure. OK, Roger. Well, our next item is going to follow on from the first one, and that is a wake-up call to the United Kingdom government on hotel quarantine. The new COVID-19 variant arriving from Brazil should act as a wake-up call to Boris Johnson and the Tories to align their hotel quarantine policy with the Scottish government's, according to the SNP. The call comes as a new variant from Brazil has been detected in Aberdeen after travellers flew from Brazil to Aberdeen via Paris and London. 
To stop new variants being let in through the back door, the SNP is, is urging Westminster to align its hotel quarantine policy with the Scottish Government and quarantine people at their first point of arrival in the UK. The SNP is urging Boris Johnson to make the decision immediately to ensure that no other variants enter the country before they're detected in the UK through testing. The SNP MSP for Aberdeenshire East, Gillian Martin, said, We've made significant progress in Scotland in suppressing the virus and rolling out the vaccine, and we cannot have that hard work undone by new variants allowed to enter the country through the back door. Um, Fatima, do you think that uh, this has shown that there is actually a back door and this is precisely what the Scottish Government was warning about, is it not? Yeah, absolutely, um, because we have Westminster who really need to get their act together and um, consider ramping up measures to ensure that we don't allow um, new strains to enter through international routes when people are travelling from abroad. Um, the Scottish Government have been following the sci science are concerned about um, the virus coming in through the back door, but then we're up against the UK government who have not been um, really um, have not been enforcing measures um, to the extent that we actually need, and um, because um, these restrictions are necessary, we need to stop the. Um, the spread of further infections and if we have and when it comes to international um, travel and when you have people coming in from the UK traveling up to Scotland and we have different measures of approach and um, then we're certainly going to see that it's, we're going to find it difficult to contain these new strains that are coming from abroad so um, absolutely I think and um, based on what you said earlier about um, the Scottish government and um, asking the Westminster government to get in line with what Scottish government is proposing I think that absolutely needs to happen. OK, Fazio, thank you very much. Um, Roger, the, the fact that these three individuals are all oil workers is interesting, isn't it? Because oil workers traditionally, especially specialists, geologists, um, well drillers and, and people with high skill levels like that, their skills are sought uh, after in, in many different locations around the world. And they can be sent to all kinds of weird places, you know, North Africa, the Middle East. Is there not a danger, uh, particularly for places like Aberdeen, of more cases coming from, shall we say, less protected uh, countries than uh, that there are at the moment? Uh, yes, but what I would uh, do is broaden this out a little bit. When people talk, for example, about this current uh, 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 variation in the virus as being the, the Brazil from Brazil. It's the Brazil uh, strain has been found in Japan, a number of other European countries and the like. So you don't need to have been in Brazil to pick up this strain of the virus. Mm, good point. And that calls into question the idea of the UK government of having this red list of a comparatively modest number of countries that they take the most uh, uh, serious attention to. Uh -huh. And I think this it confirms what the Scottish government have been saying all along, that there should be proper quarantining at the point of entry into the state, not at the final point of destination within the country, which is what is happening at, at the moment. So I think the call by Gillian Martin and others is an incredibly sensible one. And the UK government just need to understand how these strains transmit internationally. You know, the, uh, the South African strain can be found in many countries other than South Africa, yeah. uh, just as the Brazilian strain can be found in many other countries other than Brazil. So we re they really have to look at what the information is, look at what the science is and act appropriately. Because the obvious thing here, I suppose, Roger, is that this virus can only travel if people travel. So by preventing people from traveling unhindered without checks, it's very easy to stop the virus in its tracks, or it should be, shouldn't it, with the correct uh, procedures in place? Yes, if you, if you look at the developed countries that have been most successful in uh, uh, protecting their populations, the likes of your New Zealand and Australia's, for example, that people will no doubt be familiar with, they have very stringent regulations in place and they have very stringent quarantine regulations, much more so than exists in the UK. So I remain concerned that unless the UK tighten up, we're going to continue to see some external contamination 
within Scotland. Okay, um, let me turn to you, Fatima, just for my next question. There's also been some concern that the new variants, I'm not just talking about the Brazilian one, but there's been a, a, a British version, there's been a South African version, there's also been a European version, I understand, and now a Brazilian one. We don't really know, do we, yet, how effective the vaccines will be against these mutated strains of the virus. Um, so until we, we, we can get ahead of that, surely it makes a lot more sense to break the chain of transmission by simply um, having a strict um, port of entry quarantine system, exactly as Roger described. No, absolutely, because we don't know this current situation with the new strains and the COVID vaccine, we're just seeing it being developed in such a short um, amount of time. Um, and we are seeing that we haven't even finished um, vaccinating many people, even though we're making great progress. But we need to think that we started vaccinating people in December and um, now we're in March. So we need to consider that not everyone could possibly have been vaccinated at least their first dose by um, this time. So we do need to consider that um, curbing international travel, putting stricter um, stricter um, rules in place will be the best one of the best options we have at this stage while we try and determine how um, how dangerous these new strains are and how much of an impact it would ha continue to have on our social and economic way of life. So I am totally, I'm fully in support of measures that would um, curb back international travel, except in extenuating circumstances. So I think it's possible that we really need to review what we consider extenuating circumstances, because right now I think the um, field is too broad and we certainly need to narrow it down while we wait and see um, what kind, sort of impact these strains will have. Okay, Fatima and Roger, thank you very much. We're going to move on to our next story now, back to home, really, for this one. And legal advice is to be given to Parliament. The key legal advice that underpinned the Scottish Government's defence of the judicial review taken by Alex Salmond will be released tomorrow. The decision by the Deputy First Minister, John Swinney, has received the prior agreement of the law officers in line with paragraph 240 of the Scottish Ministerial Code. Ahead of the release, under the General Data Protection Regulation, legal notifications to individuals impacted are required. These are expected to be complete and subject to them. The Parliament will receive the material immediately thereafter. The Deputy First Minister John Swinney said, in normal circumstances, government legal advice is not released. Indeed, uh, such is the importance of being able to get frank private advice, it is almost unheard of for the legal advice to be released. But we have to acknowledge that the issues at stake now are not normal. The very integrity of the legal system is being questioned. Serious allegations have been made. This material allows people to confirm that these allegations are false. We have already shared in private with the Scottish Parliament's committee uh, on these issues and the substance of the advice. Now we recognise that in order to counter the false claims being made by some, we must go further. Subject to the mandatory legal checks and processes, we will release the key legal advice. Um, Roger, let me come to you first with this one. Now, this is obviously a very uh, incendiary situation at the moment, um, with various allegations having been made uh, against the First Minister, and also the Tories have been planning uh, to take action against John Swinney. Has this spiked their guns, and will the advice that's about to be published um, vindicate the Scottish Government's position, do you believe? Well, uh, let me take the Tory situation first. They're not going to be able to go ahead with the motion of no confidence since the, the basis of it has now been cast aside by the actions of the Scottish Government. Uh, that was just a bit of political opportunism on their part, as I'm sure most people would understand, but that won't play anymore. Uh, you ask me an impossible question. What do I think the <laughs> the legal I love an impossible question, Roger. It's going, it's going to be, I've not seen the legal advice. Okay. So I can comment on it. Other, other than to say this, uh, legal advice is normally heavily caveated. It is rarely as straightforward as saying, do this and that happens, yeah. and do the other and something else happens. It, and so it, the only thing I would expect is that the legal advice will be open to some political interpretation. 
As, as everything is, I guess, when you're talking about legal advice, Roger. Um, I, I suspect, I may be wrong here, would you agree with me that the fact that the Scottish Government is prepared to release this advice in public uh, tells us perhaps that the Scottish Government is confident in its own position? I think, I think, uh, I, I, I would see it very, I would see it slightly differently to that. Mm -hmm. I would see it out of respect for the Scottish Parliament that's voted twice to say that we want to see this. Now, you were right in your earlier comment in saying that it is very rare indeed for legal advice of this type to be released. Uh, I remember when I was an MP, however, at the time of the uh, 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 campaigning to get the Chilcot report uh, uh, produced and the like, there was lots of talk then about what the legal advice had been, how long it took before it reached the public domain, much longer than the, the case here, so there are occasions when legal advice is released, but it is, it is very rare circumstances. And normally where there is a judgment that there is overriding public interest. Now, what I am assuming has happened here is that uh, the Scottish government have, have said that there is overriding public interest in clearing the air and making sure that any subsequent discussion about this is on the basis of facts and not on the basis of assumptions. Okay, Roger, I think that's a fairly succinct answer. Fatima, do you have anything to add? Do you think Roger has summed the situation up well? Yeah, I agree with Roger. And um, I don't know much about the legal system because I'm not a lawyer, I haven't really studied law, but um, from an onlooker, just from an, if I were just to speak from an ordinary citizen, I'm just seeing the whole politics of it and I really don't like it. I'm just seeing a game here and and um, John Sweeney being forced to bow to political pressure um, due to a vote of no confidence. So to me, it's an absolute whole mess and I really don't like what I'm seeing. I feel that games are being played with our whole justice system. And um, to be honest, it's, it's it's not impressive to look at at all. Well, I guess we'll just have to hope it's over soon, Fatima. Anyway, let's move on now to our next story. And there's been a call for clarity over the Tory crony contracts and appointments. The SNP has challenged the UK government to come clean over appointments and multi-billion pound Covid contracts amidst further revelations of Tory cronyism at the heart of Westminster. The call comes after the Public Appointments Commissioner, Peter Riddle, uh, raised concerns over 19 roles, including four COVID-19 czars, a job in the Home Office being handed to a close friend of Boris Johnson, and the appointment of the Education Secretary's friend, James Wharton, as the Chair of the Office for Students. The concerns uh, from the independent watchdog follow a series of rev revelations that the UK government has awarded billions of taxpayers' money to companies linked with the Conservative party during the coronavirus pandemic and a court ruling that the UK government's failure to properly publish details of PPE contracts was unlawful. Um, Roger, let me hand this one to you first of all. We, we know, because we've been watching this for some weeks now, uh, that Matt Hancock recently um, was accused of acting unlawfully when it came to the awarding of PPE contracts. Um, are we any further forward with this? And is there any kind of punishment to be handed out uh, to Tory ministers for making appointments like this? Uh, I think that's going to be very difficult. The last point you make there about punishment, uh, since they're judge and jury of themselves and they're the ones that have handed out these contracts. I think what this is, is uh, a, a very clear and stark example of the level of political corruption that takes place at Westminster. It makes uh, uh, any complaints about the, the, the Scottish parliamentary system or Scottish system of, of governance seem ridiculous when you look at the scale of the corruption that has been taking place, where Tory ministers have been rewarding their friends uh, out of a pandemic, uh, which I find particularly disgraceful. In terms of what is likely to happen, I'm not convinced that anything very much is going to happen because if anything was going to happen, uh, there are very large numbers of people in the cabinet, you've already mentioned three of them, who are involved in this. And so that when it goes as high as the Prime Minister, 
the uh, health secretary, the education secretary, and I would add, and there are others involved in this, uh, I think what's going to happen is they will put up the normal defences, but they're going to ignore any moves to, for them to change their ways. Uh, we've lived with this for generations, the type of corruption that takes place at Westminster. I don't hold out any great hope that it's going to change. OK, Roger, I think that, that's a very straightforward answer. Fatima, corruption at the heart of Westminster is not a new story, is it? Um, but there's, there's not really um, much, as Roger is saying, that will be done about this because the, the people who are responsible for the cronyism are the very people who are judging themselves. In Scotland, it's different, though, isn't it? People uh, are not allowed to do this kind of thing, not allowed to give out uh, publicly funded positions to their friends and, uh, and chums, are they? Well, absolutely, because it is corrupt behaviour and it is a conflict of interest. Um, if you've got government who are um, giving con um, contracts to private companies and to think of private companies making a profit during a national crisis is absolutely, it's, it's appalling behaviour. And um, it just says a lot about the Tories. Well, do we need any, even any more proof about the Tory morals here? But it's absolutely appalling behaviour and it should never be the case. Um, if we see, I read somewhere that um, the US President Joe Biden's administration, um, they're introducing an integrity and ethics commission. Um, so that should absolutely be the case here um, to prevent something like this from happening because seeing it now, it's just, it's difficult to actually try and comprehend it when you've got a national crisis, people are literally dying and you've got private companies who are coming in and the government giving them this opportunity to profit off this. So I, it's it's something that I'm, I'm finding very difficult to accept here. The, the Americans famously have, have a written constitution which is meant to uh, control the worst excesses of those who, who, who wield the power in the American system. There's no such protections here in the UK with no written constitution which says that ministers are not allowed to do this. And if they do, there'll be you know this punishment or, or that sanction. Um, is there, do you think, um, any chance that the public will get so annoyed about this that one day they, they will, you know, they will vote the Tories out on the basis of corruption? Or are they just that maybe people just don't care? I think because and um, the COVID kind of puts it into a different perspective, because if you can see the Tories have been getting in on this corrupt behaviour in the past and they still surprisingly won the um, last general election. But I think it comes from the fact that they didn't have a very good opposition in Labour. So um, in terms of this, I think it's really up to opposition parties to really put pressure on the Tory and hold them to Tory government, sorry, and hold them to account. And absolutely, we should be seeing um, an instance where um, these rules and regulations should be clearly outlined so that there's absolutely no wiggle room or grey area for the government to behave like this at any point in, in future. So absolutely. One, one last thing uh, about this. I remember the story, I think it was Matt Hancock gave a contract for PPE to his local pub landlord. Now, he must have known that his local pub landlord had never had anything to do with PPE in his life. And he was never going to be able to fulfill the contract. If that was any other person in, in, in any other com company in the UK, um, that would have been fraud, wouldn't it? Well, we're seeing Matt Hancock get away with everything under the sun. I think there's no, um, there's no, absolutely no line that um, he, 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 he can't cross, to be honest, at this point. So it is, it is astonishing that we don't really, that we're seeing oppositions, I'm putting a lot of the blame on the opposition because we do rely on the opposition to hold the government of the day in, and like hold them to account. So um, absolutely, it's appalling for that to eat, have even been allowed. Okay, Fatima. Listen, our next uh, story is also about corruption, but this time in France. And the former French president, Nicolas Sarkozy, has been sentenced to jail for corruption. A stunned Paris court listened in silence as the former president, Nicolas Sarkozy, was found guilty of corruption and influence peddling and sentenced to three years in prison with two of them suspended. France's president from 2007 to 2012 had played an active role in forging a corruption pact with his lawyer and a senior magistrate to obtain information on a separate investigation into political donations, the leading judge declared. And there was serious and concurring evidence of collaboration between the three men to break the law. 
The conviction and sentence were dramatic, unexpected and historic. Sarkozy, 66, had repeatedly declared his innocence and dismissed the charges as an insult to my intelligence. It is, however, unlikely that he will spend a day in jail. His lawyer has announced that he intends to appeal, a process that would lead to a new trial, and a one-year uh, prison sentence can be served outside jail under certain circumstances, including wearing an electronic bracelet or limited home confinement. Sarkozy did not comment as he left the court, but his wife, the supermodel turned singer Carla Bruni, on Instagram described the verdict as an injustice. At his trial last year, the court heard how Sarkozy instructed his lawyer, Thierry Herzog, uh, to offer the senior magistrate, Gilbert uh, Azibert, a cushy job on the Côte d'Azur. In, uh, in return for information on an investigation into whether he had received donations from the ailing L'Oreal heiress Lillian Betancourt. The Betancourt case was eventually dropped, but by then an investigation into corruption and influence peddling had been opened. Now, Roger, this, uh, we, we always think of corruption as being very much a Tory thing and very much, in this case, a, a British thing. But here we have a French president being found guilty of exactly that in a court. Um, unusual, isn't it, for a, a, a president, past president of France, to be convicted in this way? It was very unusual in this case, but uh, I think I would take issue with you there that, that uh, 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 this is... Uh, uh, surprising overall. Uh, just a week or so ago, uh, Transparency International released its latest corruption index for countries throughout the world. And once again, the top 10 least corrupt countries were small countries, the mm -hmm. likes of your Denmarks, your Norways, and your like. But larger states like your France's, like your USA's, like so the UK and the like, they don't make the top 10 least corrupt countries in the world. And so we shouldn't be too surprised that corruption is more widespread than any of us would want it to be. I think the second thing I would say is it's, it's interesting the way in which the judicial system, however, in France works. I think, uh, I, I hope I am right in saying that this could now be dragged out for years and years and years before any final decision is made because of the way in which the, what we would call the appeals process works. So it's highly questionable, I think, if Sarkozy is ever going to serve a sentence as such. If he does serve a sentence, it's almost certainly going to be a home-based one. He's going to be locked down at home for a period of time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting, but I'm not perhaps quite as surprised as yourself in <laughs> cases like this arise. OK, well, thank you, Roger. Fatima, what do you think? Sarkozy, it looks like he might skip on this one. He's going to get, well, effectively, as Roger says, lockdown, which is pretty much exactly what we all have now. Well, as I understand, he's not even being banned from holding public office. Um, which to me is um, surprising considering um, further allegations like we've still got um, alleged illegal campaign funding from Libya, for instance, um, oh. under Muammar Gaddafi. So I did read that somewhere as well. And um, it is unusual that um, despite all of these allegations that um, are yet to also be um, tried as well, that he's not being banned from holding public office. So I don't think it's gone far enough, but certainly it will have an impact on the future. I just hope that um, France will take this seriously and we won't see a return of Sarkozy to frontline politics with this kind of behaviour. Um, because um, as um, Roger did mention, did say it is unusual because um, I also did read that um, the last time a French um, head of state was sentenced was in 1945 and that was for treason. So oh. it is an unusual circumstance. So oh. it was interesting reading up about this, um, the history as well. But absolutely, I think he should be banned from public office with all these allegations behind him. OK, thank you, Fatima. Well, talking about people who should be banned or otherwise from public office takes us to our next story. And Donald Trump is targeting disloyal Republicans. The ex-president, Donald Trump, hinted on Sunday at a possible presidential run in 2024, attacked President Joe Biden and repeated his fraudulent claims that he won the 2020 election in its first major appearance since leaving the White House nearly six weeks ago. 
Addressing the Conservative Political Action Conference in Orlando, Florida, Trump vowed to help Republicans to regain majorities lost during his presidency uh, in, the, in the US House of Representatives and the Senate in 2022 congressional elections, and he dangled himself as a possibility for president in 2024. Trump's weeks away from, uh, from Washington did not appear to have dimmed his anger at Republicans who voted to impeach or convict in a failed congressional effort to hold him responsible for inciting a deadly attack on the US Capitol on January the 6th. He singled out several such Republicans by name, like Senators Mitt Romney and Pat Toomey, and House lawmakers Liz Cheney and Adam Kissinger, and also suggested that uh, he would support candidates who opposed them in Republican primaries. Get rid of them all, he yelled. Well, Roger, this is not really surprising, is it? If you let Trump off the hook, which they inevitably had to do after his impeachment, he was always going to come back uh, fighting, wasn't he? And here, here he is doing exactly that. Uh, and what mustn't be forgotten is that he's got a huge uh, radical right wing base upon which to draw upon for his actions. So yes, although I find the whole thing remarkably distasteful to say the least, uh, I'm also not terribly surprised. Uh, the type of man he is, the type of psychology he displays, he's never going to admit being defeated. He's never going to admit that he did anything wrong, that he's ever made a mistake. He's always going to be seeking to get more power and uh, uh, enrich himself in different ways. So yeah, I'm not surprised, but I am still deeply concerned, however, about the amount of the core base that he has behind him. You know, there, there has been talk of a split in the Republican Party, but as things stand at the moment, I don't think that is hugely credible. I think there's going to be a lot of infighting, but it looks at the moment as if Trump is still in pole position within the Republican movement. A worrying thought there. Fatima, would you agree with uh, Roger's summing up there that Trump is still um, a, a viable threat to the, uh, to, to the Democrats in the next four years? Well, he's got a lot of um, active and um, rather effective, um, a, a rather effective base, but in the most dangerous and negative terms. I mean, to see someone like Trump, a, a leader being, to see to see a leader being banned from social media for the type of behaviour that he displays, um, it's it's absolutely concerning that he's still able to be here and and um, give out and um, all these pro promote this kind of rhetoric and for it to not even be challenged at, um, through an impeachment because he managed to escape it. So that's something that really scares me. And in terms of um, his um, hold in the Republican um, Party, as um, Roger mentioned him having some sort of hold, I think um, the fact that he's turning on, on fellow Republicans, I'm not sure um, whether or not he would probably see fit to go out on his own or something because he feels he has that base. So I'm not sure if he'll remain in the Republic, the Republican Party, or if he does return to frontline politics. I'm a bit worried that he will create this new radical far right wing party that might get some traction because it seems that um, whatever he's doing seems to be working, which is rather concerning um, for a country that's supposed to be um, the land of the free and for people to be able to build a life that they have reason to value. So I think as a, a, he's a dangerous man um, as a whole, and I'm terribly worried about what he's, um, what, he, what he's very capable of doing in terms of um, democracy. All right, Fatima, I think we'll, we'll just have to hope that your dire prediction doesn't come to pass. Well, <laughs> take, talking about uh, the president uh, now brings us to President Biden, who is urging workers to make their voices heard as US Amazon employees vote on unionization. The president, Joe Biden, defended workers' rights to form unions and warned against intimidation of workers in a video posted on Twitter last night as Amazon employees in Alabama vote on whether to unionize. Biden didn't mention Amazon, but specifically referenced workers in Alabama in a video and a tweet introducing it. He said every worker should have a free and fair choice to join a union, and no employer could take that away. It's your right, so make your voice heard, he said. 
Unions lift up workers, both union and non-union, but especially black and brown workers, Biden said in the video. There should be no intimidation, no coercion, no threats, no anti-union propaganda. No supervisor should confront their employees about their union preferences. Amazon, America's second biggest private employer, has no unionized labor in the United States. And workers at its fulfillment center in Bessemer, Alabama, would be the first if they vote in favor. Such a decision could encourage workers attempting to organize at the other Amazon facilities. Um, Roger, this is a fascinating story because um, Historically, America has not been a great place for unions in recent years. And uh, for Joe Biden to be coming out in favor of unions is quite an unusual thing for a president to be saying, isn't it, in the 21st century? Well, if you look at Biden, he's got a long history of being connected to the labor movement. And in his presidential campaign, he did say how strongly he supported things like collective bargaining in the interests of workers. So to that extent, he's got a bit of a hinterland that helps to explain this. He's obviously got to be very careful, however. I mean, uh, as you, right, you rightly described it uh, uh, in your opening remarks there, what he has not been able to do is to say to Amazon workers, this is how you should vote because that would contravene almost certainly US labor laws eh, and the like. But what he has given is a very clear indication that he wants to see an end to the kind of intimidation that workers in Alabama have faced and that they should be encouraged to exercise all of their rights. So I think he's gone as far as he can in supporting the workers. It will be interesting to see what ensues as a result of his intervention. Okay, Roger, we'll wait and see what does happen. Fatima, um, you, you probably heard the last few comments in that story about Biden saying that it was more important than ever for, uh, for black and brown workers to join a union because they seem to be probably at the bottom of the pile, really, aren't they, in terms of low wages, poor terms of employment, and the likelihood of being made unemployed. Is it as important, do you think? Uh, for black and, and, and brown workers in America, is it more important for them to join a union? Absolutely, because um, it's, there's, no, um, there's, there's no disagreeing that um, economic inequality um, significantly impacts BAME people, for instance, BAME people in particular. And joining a union sh certainly shifts the balance of power. It does offer those protections that workers do need. So it's particularly crucial for black and minority ethnic people to be in a union in order to protect their um, workers right because they already in society and um, you have this discrimination already so you're sort of starting from a disadvantaged position and i think biden does recognize that unions do offer protection they are a source of good for good bargaining as well and they will shift the balance of power mostly in favor of the workers that they protect um, against the employees who tend to exploit people is particularly people from being backgrounds who are desperate and will take up any wage just to try and make it through because they do work these mostly the menial jobs and it's very easy to exploit in that manner because it's difficult for them to get into to um, higher paid jobs uh, due to discrimination that's in place. So absolutely, I think it's essential for um, being people to be um, to have the support of a union in place. Well, we, we await developments uh, in Alabama and hopefully we'll report on them later on. Uh, now from uh, black and brown people to green ports and the trade minister Ivan McKee has called on the UK government to ensure green ports have access to the same level of setup funding as free ports in England. The Green Port model will adapt the UK government's proposals for free ports, offering a package of tax and customs reliefs. Operators and beneficiaries will be required uh, to commit to adopting Fair Work First criteria and to contribute to Scotland's just transition to net zero. In a letter to the Chief Secretary uh, to the Treasury, Stephen Barclay, Mr. McKee called for two green ports, uh, sorry, called for two green ports focused on fair and sustainable economic develop, uh, development to be established in Scotland. Um, let me come to you first, Roger, on this one. This is a slightly different uh, take on the idea of the, the, the Tories' idea of free ports. But what exactly is a green port and why is it different from what the Tories were proposing for England? 
Well, I think the way in which the Tories thought was just uh, a, a purely, a comparatively old fashioned economic move to try and stimulate business around uh, uh, ports. Uh, Ivan McKee, who, by the way, I've got tremendous regard for, I think one of the more, most imaginative ministers in the way in which he has discharged his portfolio, is seeing something that is much more modern, much more in tune, for example, with the UN's sustainable development goals, that we need to develop ports, but we need to do so in such a way that it is in tune with modern needs, it is in tune with the threat from climate change. They could really be uh, setting the scene for other types of development in Scotland. So I absolutely applaud the move by Ivan. I think it is very encouraging. I think it is very progressive. It's one of the most forward-looking approaches to ports anywhere that I've seen, uh, certainly in the Western world. Mm. And uh, you know, more power to his elbow. Okay, thank you, Roger. Fatima, um, Ivan McKee has asked for the establishment of two ports in Scotland. I'm not sure exactly where they would be, uh, but are, are you broadly in favour of this idea, the idea of giving tax and customs breaks uh, to firms who set up in these ports in exchange for their commitment to these, uh, these green credentials, these, these green philosophy that the Scottish government uh, wants them to adopt? Is that a fair exchange, do you think, to... Uh, to encourage them to be green by giving them tax uh, tax breaks? Absolutely, because I feel that our green recovery is essential to our um, economic and post-COVID recovery. So these um, green ports are, are, are an idea that I absolutely praise. And we need to consider the benefits that we'll have for workers, because as I understand, um, the businesses benefiting from green ports would have to pay their workers the living wage. So we are protecting workers in a sense as well. And we need to consider the broader aims of, um, as Roger mentioned, the, um, the um, UN Sustainable Development Goals. It's a field that I studied on my postgraduate degree and achieving these goals is going to require quite a bit of compromise between um, governments and businesses as well so I think it's a great incentive um, to be able to introduce something like green ports. Okay thank you Fatima and on the same theme of ports uh, to our next story and that is maximizing the Clyde's potential. Views have been gathered to help address the unique opportunities and challenges around the River Clyde. The Clyde mission, led by the Scottish Government, is seeking views on how it can maximise the river's economic, social and environmental potential, whilst tackling risks such as flooding. Last year, the Clyde Mission Fund provided more than £11 million of funding for projects, which will create jobs and benefit communities along the river. A further £2.3 million has also been awarded to the Clyde Gateway to support the extension of the Riverside Woodland Park at Cunnigar Loop near Dalmarnock. The project will reclaim 8.5 hectares of vacant and derelict land that has been unused for 50 years and turn it into an extended park, providing quality, accessible green space along the riverside. Uh, Roger, this sounds like a, a tremendous idea. And actually, uh, when I first read about this, I thought it, it sounds like it needs more funding than it's already got. Well, you've just made the very point I was going to make. <laughs> <laughs> great minds, Roger, is... great minds. No, I think this is such a good idea. I would like to see a, a, a step change in the amount of funding and also the scope of it. Uh, if you take the whole of the Clyde, you know, there is such a huge variety of opportunity in different types of communities and in, in different areas. And I just think this idea is of its time. And I, I, I would like to see it. We'll maybe get this in the SNP's manifesto. I would like to see an even bigger commitment to this because I think this really has got tremendous potential to help revive in an effective way much of the west of Scotland. Okay, Roger, thank you for that. Fatima, briefly, if you would, uh, what was your reaction to this, uh, this news, that there's this new funding available to help uh, people along the Clyde to, to develop businesses and to protect the environment. As I mentioned earlier, it is essential that we think about our post-COVID recovery and seeing something like this, we're, we're recognising that a lot of our resources, our natural resources in particular, are being underutilised. So I welcome, um, I welcome advances and projects and ideas like this, to put it simply. Okay, Fatima, thank you very much for that.
And uh, coming to our, our final story of the evening, and this time we're going to Bosnia-Herzegovina, and it's their Independence Day. Bosnia-Herzegovina marked the 29th anniversary of its independence today. Bosnia and Herzegovina became independent from the former Yugoslavia following an independence referendum held, held on the 29th of February and 1st of March 1992. The results of the referendum were announced on March the 6th, 1992, and Bosnia and Herzegovina were admitted to the United Nations on May the 22nd, 1992. Bosnia and Herzegovina became in an independent state, but had to suffer a bloody battle for independence, war crimes and genocide committed by forces controlled by the former Yugoslav government and suffered the loss of hundreds of thousands of lives. While traces of the war, which was fought between 1992 and 1995, are still evident, and the complex political structure of the Dayton Peace Agreement, which ended the war, has limited the country's ability to reach its full potential. This is still a young, old country full of hope for a prosperous future. Roger, with the, uh, the independence referendum still very much in people's minds here in Scotland, can we learn anything, do you think, from Bosnia and Herzegovina and their experience of becoming independent and, uh, and acceding to the United Nations? Well, I think there are two big points I would want to make. Uh, and the first one is this. Aren't we so fortunate in Scotland that we've got a pathway to independence that doesn't involve uh, having to take up arms and having to fight a war? Uh, Scotland has it within its own grasp, the possibility of achieving independence entirely peacefully. And I, for one, think that is an opportunity to be grasped, but also one to be very grateful about that such an opportunity faces us. Secondly, I think you made a very important point, and that was the way in which there was engagement, has been engagement with the United Nations in getting the uh, legitimate international legitimacy to Bosnia and Herzegovina as they uh, achieved their independence. I think Scotland needs to do a bit more, in all honesty, to engage yeah. with the United Nations and other international bodies so that we too can secure the benefits quickly of uh, legitimacy in the international stage. Okay, Roger, that's a, a nice clear answer there. Fatima, would you agree with Roger that, the, um, that Scotland needs to do more to establish links with the United Nations even before it has its independence referendum? Absolutely, and I completely echo what um, Roger's just said just now. Um, as you're aware, I'm with the Aberdeen Independence Movement, and we've spoken a lot about um, international legitimacy and how we should be grateful that we do have a democratic process that we can go through and in such a peaceful manner. And international legitimacy is um, one of the ways in which we need to ensure that we respect because that would secure that would that would recognize our independence um, on the national stage as well so i absolutely agree with what roger said and to be honest i don't have anything to add there because he's made um, particularly salient points okay father just one what well, ha well i think we should all uh, join in and, and wish uh, bosnia and herzegovina a happy independence yeah. day today um, which yeah, brings yeah. us almost to the end of our time here this evening. <laughs> and of course, at this time in the programme, it's my job to remind you that uh, Broadcasting Scotland is currently holding a major crowdfunder. As you know, we want to be here for the big events of 2021 and to be able to report them to you as they happen. To do that, we need your help. So if you'd like to become a supporter of Broadcasting Scotland for just £5 a month, you can sign up by following the uh, information on your screen now. You can also make an individual donation. And if you don't have enough money to make a donation, don't worry, you can always volunteer. Anyway, that's about it from myself tonight. It just remains for me to thank my two guests, Fatima Joji and uh, Roger Mullen, for being my guests this evening. And from all of us here at the programme at Scotland at 7, a very good evening to you. What distinguishes Broadcasting Scotland from a website or blog, apart from our brilliant programmes? Hi there, I'm Gordon Ross. Are the costs we face to enable us to produce those programmes? These costs are significant and ongoing. However, our facilities are able to do so much more if only we had the staff. In the last year, some of our supporters have cancelled their subscriptions. In one way, we would prefer it if it was because they didn't like us. 
rather than it being because of the financial pressures which we are all under because of COVID. The really positive outcome of our fundraiser is that at a time of economic challenge in Scotland, we will use your donations to create jobs and in a small way contribute to improving the Scottish economy. If you want us to be Scotland's independent broadcaster, able to provide an alternative mainstream television platform, then please support us. Scotland is going to be an independent country. Just imagine what we could do if we had even 1% of the BBC Scotland Channel's budget. Imagine. And then please consider turning your imagination into reality. Please support us if you can afford it. Hey.